Good evening. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio. Welcome to today's program, an overview of architecture and leadership presented by Allison Grace Williams, FAIA. This is the fifth in a series of six design lectures presented by AI Ohio this year. Before we start today's program, I'd like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors that are highlighted on the screen. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us bring the innovative and quality programming we are enjoying all this year. I'd also like to thank all of, the, all of those who have made donations to the AIA Ohio Foundation as part of the registration process for the lecture series. For those members wishing to make a larger impact on the future of the profession, please consider joining me and our fellow members listed on the screen now who have invested a minimum of $1,000 in lifetime giving to the AIA Ohio Foundation. If you're interested in learning about the Charles Marr citation, please contact AI Ohio president or the president of the AI Ohio Foundation, Bruce Sikanik. Before we get started, um, I'd like to also highlight a few of AI Ohio's upcoming programs. Our sixth and final design lecture will, in our 2021 series will feature uh, Sung Ho Kim and Heather Wolfter on Thursday, August 26th. The AI Ohio Design Awards will be virtual this year. Save the date and plan on joining us when we announce and celebrate AI Ohio's Design Award recipients. We'll also be announcing the winners of AI of the AI Ohio Student Design Competition, which will feature projects from Ohio Schools of Architecture. Uh, let's see. The slide also includes the dates and uh, topics for the upcoming AI Ohio Practice Innovation Series that will begin in September. Uh, so just a few housekeeping items. Our program today uh, is scheduled for one and a half hours, which will include Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, we encourage you to put them in the chat box. And um, at the end of the program, we'll be looking to the chat box to identify uh, those who would like to have ask a question of the speaker. Um, there'll be a link placed in, also in the chat box towards the end of the presentation. Um, during the Q&A session, uh, please follow that link to enter your information and member number so that you'll receive the learning units for today's program. Finally, I'd like to thank Robert Mashke for selecting the speakers and moderating our design series for AI How this year. So thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Robert to introduce our design speaker for this evening's program. Robert? Thank you, Karen. Architect Allison Grace Williams, FAIA, has amassed an international portfolio of large-scale civic, cultural, and research facilities. While in practice at SOM, Perkins & Will, and AECOM, Williams' inventive instincts and interdisciplinary design leadership generated award-winning buildings that bridge culture, technology, and the environment. Her most successful projects and the work of the organizations and institutions with whom she collaborates are a commentary on the order of priority they place on the relevant issues of our time and are reflective of their sponsors' concerns for sustainable environments and for inclusive, equitable, and socially just outcomes. Williams established AGW MS Studio in 2017. It is built on her history as a respected team leader who enlists the power of ideas and design thinking as creative tools and mission strategic problem solving. Her clients have included corporations, institutions, and other design professionals at critical moments in their creative process. Williams partners with them to imagine impactful concepts and synergistic design solutions as their narrative toward shaping a positive future. In addition to design consulting and pro bono efforts, Allison is an adjunct lecturer at Stanford University, a frequent keynote speaker and an academic lecturer. Please welcome Allison Grace Williams, FAIA.
Allison, unmute, please. Good evening. And thank you very much, Robert and the Ohio AIA for inviting me and allowing me to have what I want to call really is a conversation as opposed to a lecture. You know, I have this opportunity now and then, and I, and I use these moments as a time to really think about where I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing, and, um, you know, where I'm headed. And I, I do believe there's, there's an important moment that has been afforded me and, and all of us, frankly, with the pandemic, that we've been forced into moments of more self-reflection or solitary work uh, environments where we probably work a little differently and think a little differently about what we're doing. So um, my resume, which, which Robert uh, shared with you is really a foundation, a statement of a foundation of how I practiced for 40 years. And the decision at some point about four years ago was that it was really time to, um, sorry, it was time to create a platform which was really more about um, the things that that drive me. I'm not sure why I can't seem to forward this. Oh, I see, I see, I see. It's over here in the corner. Sorry about that. Okay. So I formed an umbrella of sorts, that umbrella being um, several things, a way to collect the things that I've always enjoyed doing, um, much of them the foundation of those 40 years of practice, um, a way to protect myself from the things that um, are what other people think you should be doing and, um, and to learn how to engage in things that are truly important architecturally that are relevant and are refreshing and are forward thinking at the same time that they incorporate um, the things that you believe in. So it was a protection, but it was also uh, you know, a way just to make sure that as you as you practice that and as you move into a more mature state in your career, that you are doing the right thing. Meaning, uh, been at this for a while, and I think leadership begins to change its meaning depending on where you are in your profession. So the idea of using my time best to mentor and to think strategically and to offer opportunities um, to those who are coming along uh, behind me, I think feels more appropriate than, and, and to have my sleeves roll up and still designing, but with a very different attitude about um, my role in the room. So um, AGW Studio is uh, a consulting practice that, um, ideally keeps me engaged in large scale projects, which is uh, where I spent my time, large scale civic um, uh, kind of public interventions um, in urban places. So I have an assortment of things that I'm working on. Everyone knows about the Oakland A's and we, our fingers are crossed here on the West Coast in the Bay Area, that they will stay put here. In the interim, I've been a consultant um, position squarely in between big, the design team for the stadium and the, um, the millions of square feet of commercial area around it, um, between the, that design team and the, um, the A's ownership. And that was to bring kind of an urban design along with the master planners, which I'm not a consultant, um, to bring an urban design nose to the idea of, of the design guidelines that will enable uh, viable development of commercial, um, residential, uh, affordable housing surrounding the network of, of circulation around the ballpark. So this is really sitting in the balance right now um, with a lot of fingers crossed for it to go ahead but it's been a really good thing. I, I grew up in Oakland, though I was raised in Cleveland, grew up in Oakland, and so it's very important that they stay put. 
Another thing that I'm doing on a, on a um, three, it's a three year cycle. HDR has, HDR, the architectural firm, has um, an internally initiated program of design excellence. And it's on a 12 year cycle with four um, chairs, each taking a three year cycle. And I believe this is the third three year cycle and I'm in the second of my three years. And what they do is they, they um, ask, they don't require their, their design teams within the entire firm to put forward their work at whatever stage they're in and, and bring it to a jury. I would be the chair for three years, but the jury itself would be changing um, each year. And to come out of a two or three day deliberation with um, a series of awards that really are looking at the work critically um, not so much trying to offer recommendations for teams going forward, but to really try and put the broader lens on what design excellence is, is, is meaning now. It's beyond, uh, it's beyond beauty, it is beauty, but it's performative aspects of all sorts, equity and everything else. So that's, I feel, it is another tether keeping me very engaged in the scale of work and the issues that come along with it. Um, next week, I'll be in Boston at the GSD um, where this second round for me is being held. And next year I'll be in Toronto. Last year it was virtual. So it was right here in my studio. <laughs> Um, another thing about having your own umbrella is you can kind of choose the things that you really want to do, the affiliations that you feel are important, and they are not in any way um, in conflict with a broader firm agenda or conflict of interest. And one of the things that um, I was asked by Deanna Van Buren, who is really the founder of Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, which is um, a movement. It's an architectural movement about prison environments and how to remove the need for them and thinking more about restorative justice. So as I joined her, um, as I joined her board, um, I think two years ago, it was to bring in um, an advocacy for design excellence, not only an advocacy for the the mission of the organization of the firm, but also to tether it strongly to the architectural outcomes and the processes through which um, the three-dimensional aspect of the mission um, emerges. And so that, that has been, again, using a different part of my brain um, in a more uh, consulting way, but really with a focus on the boardroom and how to um, help uh, that firm uh, move forward with this amazing agenda, which has got such legs right now. If you don't know it, you should look it up. And then um, teaching is something I, I am adjunct at Stanford, but last year I was um, awarded the Distinguished uh, Professor, uh, Joseph Escherich Professorship at UC Berkeley in the College of Environmental Design. And um, given what was going on last summer as I was prepping for this, it seemed like I needed to make sure that there was relevance in the topic at hand. And importantly, uh, choosing something that was at the foreground of everyone's mind, uh, and certainly in this country, but also finally globally, um, since the studio was made up of 12, 12 students who at that moment had been flung around the world into their childhood bedrooms, um, this project uh, needed to be something that brought us together around these issues of equity and advocacy, which every country has been dealing with and our issues over this past summer are globally renowned. So I decided, kind of a little bit pulled it out of my, my head, what if there were an International Center for Black Lives Matter and it was all of it had all of these characteristics that were about um, placemaking and equity and uh, catalytic opportunity, and really 
Uh, this is the slide just talking about the whole class was like some were drinking coffee, some were drinking wine, some weren't awake yet, somebody had a new baby. It was a pretty incredible uh, experience. Uh, but the site was one that was already um, determined in East Oakland, which is one of the most difficult um, areas within the city of Oakland, one of the most wonderful, historically wonderful neighborhoods that is wrought with, um, with all the things that uh, have coagulated there in terms of violence and deprivation over the years. And the Green Line is International Boulevard, and our site or multiple sites were along this major thoroughfare, um, the base of the Oakland Hills, you know, nighttime difficult, nighttime activity, prostitution, drugs. But the goal was to see if architecture could take on a role in creating something that was of permanence and not a community center, not a museum, but really a, a place which might um, engage artists, writers, scholars, researchers, neighbors, um, and architects in developing a place for uh, uh, visiting fellows, for art exhibits, for community gatherings. Um, and amazingly, the students grabbed this in a way, even if they were um, not in the US, each of their cultures had some kind of advocacy or uprising, which which is part of their history, part of their culture that they brought to the table and they brought it to the table in spades. Um, many of the um, solutions were um, you know, quite brilliant and quite um, attuned to the idea of cultural equity as it relates to, um, to our responsibility as designers. And you know, so that, that was very restorative, very difficult, very exhausting. And during the pandemic, um, you know, when you're stuck in front of your screen, you know, you're dealing with everything. We all know this, but I don't know about your house. In our house, we photographed our food. We cooked very frequently, much more frequently than ever before. And we tended to like lay it up on the table and photograph it and laugh and eat together. And so the upside of the last um, 2020, we'll say, was that it brought people closer together made us understand each other better, brought us together around ridiculous things like this 1,000 piece puzzle, uh, which by the way, is not finished yet. Um, it also, as any dutiful architect should, is that moment where the cobbler's children no longer have an excuse for having no shoes, that it's time to deal with construction, renovation, um, all of those things that we sometimes don't have time for when we're away from our house all day. So for me, I had the opportunity finally to resolve this completely functional kitchen into a, and I love this kitchen um, because if you, if you couldn't see it, it meant we didn't have it and everything was kind of in reach. And I love this kitchen, but it finally gave way over time during the pandemic. Um, to a kitchen that streamlined, small streamlined, things have their place. Uh, and the good news is I pretty much built it all myself with the help of some key uh, 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 services such as bringing in that uh, countertop and, and uh, um, manufacturing some of the elements, but I laid the floor, I hung the sheetrock you know, I bought specific things, you know, so I look at this and I think uh, it definitely climbed up another hill of things that I didn't think I could do. And it feels like that's part of what was important for me to be doing in my career in general. Um, it, it resolved my backyard, which there were moments when it looked better than this over the 30 years that I've lived there. But, you know, before I started the construction back there during the pandemic, getting the deck built just in time, it was looking kind of like this at the moment when the fence finally blew over in the wind, it was definitely time to do something. Transformed that into that, got the deck built just in time for the pandemic and evolved the backyard, which continues to evolve and you know, continues to do everything we needed it to do during the pandemic um, as a place to be outside in your own house, you know, as a place to uh, play with your dogs and 
invite people up through the alleys so that they can come to your backyard without going through your front door. We've all been through this. And even when the sky turned orange here on September 9th, 2020, because of the uh, forest fires, you know, we were reminded, mind you, this is uh, nighttime, uh, just before the sunset, the lights were on, and this is morning. The lights went off in the morning, and then they came back on because the sky was so red. And the story continues that moved this room at the back of my house where there used to be a wall, transformed it again. I built all the cabinetry, all of that stuff I built. I laid the floor, I hung the ceiling, I had electrician and it did the appropriate code things, but it was pretty much Almano translated that into that by opening up the back of the house with these amazing doors called panoramic doors that completely fold away to the left and and make the outside of the house, the inside of the house. So the backyard becomes that room. That room is my studio. That's the room I'm sitting in right now. And uh, it just felt like I was doing all the right things for the moment in time. These are not professional photographs. You know, it is ongoing. Some things are still unpainted. You see my running shoes there and at my desk. But um, very importantly, this has been uh, an important, uh, importantly, um, kind of restorative time. Um, I've always drawn, uh, my undergraduate degree is in practice of art, uh, mostly printmaking. So it's also been a time to really uh, think about lines, figure ground, the things about graphics of space and even two dimensional things and the juxtaposition of color. And um, I did this series of drawings that were called Out of the Woods. So this is about the landscape abstraction of landscape and moving out of the ground and above the ground and into the sky and out of the woods, so to speak, however that might mean. So there's a series here, studies, which I've just learned are gonna be um, on display at the Royal Academy in London for their summer exhibition. So I always draw, always, always draw in the context of being um, in that explorative, exploratory mode for architecture. Um, and so the drawing part, when you're just drawing, when you're not drawing to try and figure out some architectural problem, isn't quite the same as drawing when you are in fact in the process of resolving and exploring and testing. So one of the things that the studio is doing right now that's currently on the boards and still very early, I'm in partnership with Studio MLA, that's um, Mia Lira, um, architects in landscape architects, Mia Lira, landscape architects in Los Angeles, who was um, pursuing uh, a 14 acre park at the uh, Texas fairgrounds in Dallas. And it had just a sweet pavilion that will probably be a $10 million project. And she called and asked if I would join her. And um, we interviewed for it online, like I'm sure a lot of you have during the pandemic. And we we're really, really lucky and, and happy to have won it. Um, that is one of the best locations for preserved uh, Art Deco fairground. Um, you know, statuary, murals, and the, the basic bones of the buildings are there and they've been restoring them all along. But that fairground is built on the backbone of the neighborhood that used to occupy that land. That land was taken from a largely black successful community in South Dallas um, in order to create the fairground. And the image on the upper right, uh, where it says project site, that then the yellow footprints are the neighborhoods and houses that used to be there, the, the, um, the public facilities that used to occupy this place were basically uh, taken away. And um, in addition to that insult, the residents of the neighborhood that it was and that the remaining neighborhood were only allowed to go there on certain uh, specific days when, um, when black people were permitted to come to the fair. So this is just like, it grates hard and it, it, uh, it gives meaning and purpose uh, beyond the design um, opportunity 
to really think about the foundation of it. This is the site right here. It is a parking lot for the most part um, for uh, the once or twice a year uh, uh, time when the fairgrounds in the month between September and October really when the fair is in, in place or when there's a major um, performance at the nearby Dos Equis, um, uh, Expo uh, where concerts come in. This is really basically a parking lot. So it's, it's painful to see it that way, realizing right across the street, there's this, this really solid, really under, under, um, under privileged, I'll say, but solid community um, that is very excited about the opportunity for this to become a community park. So I had this idea along with my colleagues. I'm, I'm teamed with a local firm called BC Concept and I'm the design lead, but again, you know, we need each other. We're working together with MLA. So these are some early sketches, but this idea of them, they're really not being a building, but being this incredible shade structure that would be oriented on the site in such a way that it, it um, controlled and even induced the Southeast winds that um, shaded the, um, the area underneath and that allowed for some really limited and closed component underneath. So it became really about performance in the environment. And, you know, we're just at the point, I just pulled these off the SketchUp model, but we're still in concept. But the notion is that it's, 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 it's going to be kind of a linear building. Um, the shape of its roof is not yet known. But the idea that it might be green, that it might heave out of the ground, that it might, maybe you can walk on it, but that fundamentally it's creating shade and it's creating um, uh, usable outdoor space for as many hour, for as many hours of the day and, and months of the year as possible. But what I also realized is that I do have this um, kind of fascination or, or kind of commitment to buildings that are environmentally environmentally pretty much uh, driven. And in, in the case of many of the projects I've worked on, you know, this lends itself to elongating linear, properly oriented buildings. And it, it occurred to me as I was doing this um, project in Texas, that it is a, it is a recurring theme for me. And in fact, I've probably done five or six 400 foot long buildings in my time. So it's kind of fun also during the pan pandemic, but at a moment where you're looking back at the things that you've done and where you know that some, some series of uh, uh, processes of how one evolves in collaboration with others um, at a big idea. And for me, um, that notion of orientation, minimizing interior condition space uh, has more and more become a theme and it's it, I'm not alone in that but I think that it is it is kind of the portal um, where we need to go uh, in terms of climate change and energy use. So NASA afforded an opportunity um, the red bar here uh, is a new lab. It's not a huge lab it's about 50,000 square feet it's on the um, NASA Ames campus here in Mountain View, California. And, you know, it sits along what you'd call the main drag. And you can see that trellised area there is completely outdoor space facing south. And uh, originally that space would have been interior circulation space. And at a certain moment as we were uh, trying to figure out how to, um, to be really efficient with our dollars, it occurred to us that in that climate, it's very possible to put the circulation between the labs, which are kind of in the sol under the solid roof, put the labs in that space and put the corridor used to move um, from lab to lab, um, which would normally have been a separate corridor, not the corridor inside the labs that might join the labs together, but the corridor that links the labs along a common uh, pathway. We put it outside and we shaded it with, with large London plain trees. And we expanded it, as you can see there at the close end, to cover an outdoor space that became a corporate gathering place, um, an incredible uh, kind 
kind of outdoor uh, see or be seen space and very much of the civic uh, armature, the civic uh, spine, uh, which dead ends here in one of the gigantic, beautiful wind tunnels. And so that laciness, that kind of external structural, exo, um, exo structural expression also inspired us in the way that the light plays around these light surfaces. It becomes part of a vocabulary. These are still renderings here, but um, it, it is actually built and you'll see a few built images here, but you can see how that upper, it's almost like Piano Noble level <coughs> in the civic space um, of the, of the, uh, the public spine. And when it broadens at the end, this is where it's, it's covering um, what can be an outdoor eating space, giving light into the uh, administrative spaces and the auditorium uh, beyond. And these are on the day of the opening um, pretty much uh, emerged intact in terms of the big ideas and, you know, the landscape will come mature and, and really put it in its place on this, it, this incredible campus. It, it would be the newest mm -hmm. lab building there in uh, some time. It, it's pretty, pretty wonderful how the light uh, really magnifies the texture of things. That's another thing that, that is all part of thinking about uh, sun and daylight as a second material. This, the second lab, which I, the, the first lab that you just saw was with ACOM as uh, the design director for the West Coast. This is another one, although this is at Langley in, um, in Virginia and it's the Design Excellence Commission. And here it is a lab basically to study laser technology. And there was a moment where I remember being in the meeting and the engineers, they wanted to have at least 48 feet um, in order to, uh, which would be four 12 foot lab modules so that they could maximize the linear inside area that they could control. And it just occurred to me, what if it was more than just 48 feet? What if you could find a way to organize like this little sketch here organize um, the main components of the lab building, pull all of the vertical um, uh, support elements, such as the elevators, the toilet rooms, the stairs, to the degree that you can pull them out and still keep their distance, um, pull them out. And then along the backbone, push all the vertical risers. And then in between for all of the ground floor, um, make it so you could just for 400 feet combine as many 12 foot uh, modules as possible. And so the outcome here became a building that was very narrow and very long with a kind of edicula, um, which the engineers really like to call it a capsule. So we started calling it a capsule, like a capsule metaphorically um, for space travel. And that contained the, the toilet rooms and stuff. It also contained a conference area and um, some flexible space on the bridge that connects. And here on the right, you can see the ground floor. You know, this is nestled up against a campus of other older buildings. This is definitely the first lab on this Langley campus in over 50 years. And so it all became about that south facing wall of Brie Soleil, um, which, uh, um, mitigated the sun and gave kind of a backdrop for the capsule that was clipped on the front. Here in the plan, you can see the, um, the uh, office spaces are along the, the south wall um, where the brise is very effective. And then the labs are the complete length. And you can see the one thing that, that um, kind of pollutes the, the open area of that bar are the stairs at either end, but the backbone is, is uh, vertical circulation, freight elevator, which, you know, those gave an opportunity to really choreograph an expression on the back, kind of unselfconsciously choreograph where the shafts could happen um, without really disturbing uh, the character of the labs. And so here kind of slicing it like a sausage from left to right, the capsule, the bridge, the offices, the labs, the corridor, the, um, the mechanical systems. And this is built. 
again, it, it attend, intentionally wanted to be a light color building in order to utilize the opportunities of shade and shadow. shadow. Um, there's vocabulary in the campus of um, terracotta. <clears throat> so some portions of the building, you can see them in reflection there, um, really became terracotta, but, but really the ground floor, you can pass right through this open space. And um, so the building is sitting lightly on the ground and, and trying to be as porous as it can be at the ground plane. Um, always liked it better in black and white. So here, this is a black and white image, the darker colors, obviously the terracotta. Another project up on the hill behind the UC Berkeley campus is a lab building for, um, for Lawrence Labs, Berkeley Labs. And we want, this is a Perkins and Will project, also 400 feet long. One, um, I wanna say probably 2010 or 11 and completed in um, 2013 or 14. Um, I believe this was considered a non-buildable site for most of the time, because you can see on the right-hand image, the roadway uh, to the right of the new building uh, is 106 feet lower than the, the horizontal plaza area on the uphill side. And it was filled with utilities, um, but it became a very, very important gateway site. Um, it was uh, imagined by Stephen Chu when he was the energy secretary, um, US energy secretary. And he really became the, the in inspiration uh, for making this the place where um, the high performance computational um, experimentation was done on climate change. So the big requirement was an 80 foot clear span um, that in at some moments needed to be 400 feet long. So the final resolution that you see here is a shifted bar because being the city of Berkeley, um, even though they had no jurisdiction over the project because it's on the Lawrence lab um, site, um, they were given an opportunity to comment and you know, their, their sensibilities about the continuous facade uh, became uh, critically important and in many ways uh, became a reason for shifting the, the continuous bar at approximately the midpoint. But secondarily, and maybe primarily, frankly, by shifting it, it allowed, it allowed us to tuck the building back into the hill a little bit more because otherwise it would have begun to fly out um, over the topography and would have required far more uh, um, a retaining wall, which you can see is just immense retaining wall all along the back side of this building. But those are blowout views, the Bay Area, and you know, all across the Bay Area. You can here see the slope of the building and the, and the um, magnitude of, of the um, retention walls. And sectionally, this is what it had to do. You know, the lowest level is really the location for all the mechanical equipment, air handling units. Um, space for it to grow. They're not all in place there. Um, the pathway that is aligned with that mechanical level is a public thoroughfare because the campus needed to be accessible. Um, you know, within, once you're secure on the campus, it became part of the pathway through the campus. The floor above that is where the, um, where the computers are, and that's the 80 foot long span um, over the long length of <clears throat> approximately 400 feet, and then two floors of office space above it. Original schemes actually had it rotated in the hill um, 90 degrees, so it would have been more cantilevering and projecting out into the landscape and um, would have been a better, better orientation, frankly, for the solar, but I think the retaining wall problem won out here. And here you can see just the clean, straightforward character of the inside. Um, only, only partially uh, inhabited, but it, it's a really powerful building when you're when you're up there. It's a very straightforward, very utilitarian, um, and and really quite beautiful when the sun hits it just the right way. And and uh, at certain moments, these fins are quite impactful. You know, limited fenestration on the west because of that orientation. 
and on the top side is where you get in into this uh, lobby space that affords a view through the building and uh, a knob on that entryway which is the stair that takes you around and careful fenestration. The other thing that wouldn't have happened if the building had went, been one straight bar is this moment where, where, the, um, where the bar offset and offered um, this uh, southward view um, and a corner in the middle of the building. Here you can, you can just see all the concrete that was required to even find a flat place to enter the building. And in terms of how this might have uh, looked or been, you can see here if that original um, trajectory of the bar had continued, it would still be on the property line within the property, but it would have been really jettisoning out. Um, quite dramatically. The cooling towers are off up to the side. You can see the, the big piping um, going from their handling back to the cooling towers that are tucked in the hill. And by the way, this is less than um, 500 feet from a fault line. So it is a very, very sensitive site. And I always, again, I really believe it was an unbuildable site, but it was deemed to be the right site for this building. And then probably the longest of all long building, this is another design excellence that I won with Perkins and Will, it's at Calexico Mexicali point of entry. And the site you can see here, just the texture, Mexicali is on the south, you know, over, um, you know, a million people jammed into a very tight geographic space. And on the other side, the US side, um, about 42,000, um, on a good day when, um, when everybody's there, um, uh, uh, close to 15,000 people cross this border and just to do business or to get their children to school um, or to use medical um, uh, facilities. Um, so this is one of the most busy locations, but the site itself really is pretty much 2,500 feet long. Um, and has a change in elevation of about 30 feet. And it is uh, it's gonna be phased. It's, it is being phased to finally replace an existing um, uh, port of entry building, which is quite um, uh, outdated. Uh, but it was really mostly about how to, I, was, I, I chose Tom Leader to go after this with me. And we, from the very beginning, believed in trying to make a building that would be of the landscape where you couldn't quite tell where the building began and where the landscape ended. And so this notion, if south is to the right and north, I'm, I'm sorry, south is to the left and north is to the right, we really cut into the land to create this really cool spot. And by that, it's a cool spot, but it's also temperature wise, it's a cool spot because it would be in shade for most of the time, shaded by the building as a place of respite for the workers. And the building itself then hovering, the main portion of the building hovering over with the outlook point for, um, for the, uh, the uh, border patrol to be able to oversee the border, the cars coming through, the people waiting. Um, as they go through the pavilion after waiting in line under the hot sun, through the pavilion, through this waiting area at the border into the pavilion, which was really meant again to hover above a very glassy space and to give way to the civic um, grid of Calexico itself. And the portion that is built is the vehicular uh, portion and the pavilion, the people pavilion, will ultimately replace the existing um, entry pavilion. It's funded, but not clear exactly when that next phase is going to kick in. And then finally, you know, the August Wilson Center is one of those projects that um, until I actually won it by international competition back in 2000 something, one maybe or two, um, I didn't really understand completely what it meant to be operating on all cylinders. Um, this was a project for originally the um, African American Cultural Center for Western Pennsylvania. And it had a huge 
faithful um, initiating leadership of um, Pittsburghers, um, Black Pittsburgh, Pittsburghers, who decided against many people's wishes to choose a site in downtown Pittsburgh as opposed to the Hill District um, because the importance of, of making this place is far beyond just making a place which would gather um, people of that culture, but to share that culture. And they chose this site. It's about a block and a half from Bignoli's um, Convention Center. And it is on one of the busiest streets um, in downtown Pittsburgh. And we were so honored to win the competition. Um, and during, we won the competition and during the design pro process, August Wilson died. And because his Gulf series, he was a native of Pittsburgh and his Gulf series were all cited in the Hill District, his family um, bequeathed his name to the center. And at that moment, everything changed. You know, this center, um, the land was given by the redevelopment agency for pennies. We entitled it for not only the center itself, which is about 65,000 square feet, um, but we also entitled 100 feet of building on top of it. So to sit on top of it, ultimately, it is entitled and grandfathered to, um, to carry another 10 floors of uh, maybe uh, uh, hotel or condo or maybe eight floors of office or maybe three mega floors of exhibition space. It's very open mixed use. But again, the big eye, it's 400 feet long, by the way, along the, um, the length of Liberty, um, it's triangular site, but along the length of Liberty, that bar a very daylighted space punctuated by this bit of urban art on the corner is um, 400 feet long and really meant to function as a big picture window for what goes on in there. And therefore it's constantly changing um, place that you come upon depending upon the time of the day. It's really a nighttime building for sure, but it has a 500 seat uh, full fly auditorium theater in it. And um, with uh, an orchestra pit. And so it fills a niche for this, um, for the cultural district and for Pittsburgh, which is a big theater place. It fits right into a niche of 500 seats um, for all sorts of performances. And then packed on the um, left hand side here, behind this big wall, which is one of the drivers of the land, of the place, the solidity of the culture. Uh, packed into that backside is a windowless area, which um, has a very uh, sophisticated uh, mechanical system and can attract and accommodate just about any Smithsonian level traveling exhibit. So it's about uh, um, 11,000 square feet of exhibition, 500 seat theater and um, classrooms and admin space. You know, this is one of my sketches from early in the, the left is, the, is a competition sketch. Um, kind of brought forward. Take the long side that faces um, north and put as much glass there as you can and raise the, the main uh, kind of pedestrian level up one and then you're overlooking the historic district um, protected forever in its height and did a very careful sun study actually too. And I've been there a few times on July, on, on June 21st and there's only a moment when the sun actually hits that glass. Otherwise, it's allowed to be just a place um, where, the, where the burden of the sun um, is, is not critical and the ability to engage the texture of the city and be seen at night. This is a competition drawing. You can see it was a three-story building, became a two-story building with super high floor-to-floor -floor heights. Um, here you can see the plan idea going from left to right, that, that um, barge of space with the auditorium theater sitting right in it. And the exhibition spaces um, exist on two levels. And the crush space, which is the gray, um, gives way to these uh, rooms at the upper level with these gigantic um, tiger wood doors that, that we designed that pivot in place. They're about 20 feet tall. And, and they really make the space become one.
and this was a sketch from the competition, you know, imagining what if um, you did build that tower on top and the columns are engineered actually to receive the building that I described in the future. And for me, it never seems quite complete. It's one, until that piece comes along, it's one of those things where you never ever will lose touch with the client because like many cultural facilities, the act of building them, you know, imagining them, building them, funding them, all of that stuff is, it's a long process and they become your friends. They still have my cell phone number and will call me as recently as three months ago, making me aware of something that they would like to do and they would like my blessing and would I be a consultant to help them, you know, take care of things. And I, I'm honored that they remember that, but it, it's also a reminder that buildings have a life beyond the life that they begin with. You know, they have a life before they exist. They have a life during the process of making them. And they most importantly have that life afterwards. And it's that life in many ways for which we're designing, not just environmentally, but socially, and um, culturally. And for me, this building, you know, will always remain um, alive because of that. You know, I've had the opportunity to present on the stage. I've been part of AI is right across the street in the Bruno building. It's like 15 foot wide building. It's an amazing brick building where the AIA is. And I've had the honor of um, doing that, um, the AIA awards for Pittsburgh. Um, on the stage of this building. And, you know, it just doesn't get more satisfying than that. Um, since the building was built, dance troops have been um, established around the August Wilson Center. You know, theater groups have found this as their home. Uh, it is really a place, it made a place in culture um, for black culture, but also it gets used by everybody. And, and it is an inviting building that, that um, kind of requests people to walk right on in off the street. You don't have to pay to walk in off the street. There's a cafe at ground level and um, only on certain days, I imagine, um, are you allowed to go upstairs without paying. But it's, it's, it's really the anatomy of the building is all about light and openness and uh, performance in many different senses of the word. But here you can sense that big picture window of space, um, it marking the corner. And every time I, and, and this is a postcard that someone made and sent to me, um, taken it with a very, very wide angle, but um, on some red carpet night when, it, you know, the gathering of, of actors from you know, black actors um, come here. And on the 10th anniversary in 2019, they invited me to come back and I did. And there were many actors there, big name actors who came across the red carpet. And it just, I just feel like it's part of me forever. So I, 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 I troll the internet now and then and I find these completely unstaged images like this one um, where uh, you, know, you just always feel like you're part of what's going on in there. And the, you know, sometimes they use the exterior wall as part of a, um, a display. In this case, this was, um, this was, I want to say maybe seven or eight years ago where the, these films on the wall were, um, were um, electronic um, touch points that you could come up to and touch and it would speak back to you. And so it became this attraction. And then on that same night at the um, 10th year anniversary, um, it was amazing to see them using the space. This is where they set up the bar and they, they're using it in a theatrical way um, in which it was always intended. And they're taking very good care of the building. And, and I have to tell you that that is part of what we as architects get the satisfaction of doing is um, uh, imagining and um, engaging people. Um, we go into their world, they come into ours um, and we create something together and then we watch it grow. And I just, you know, the topic of this is architecture and leadership. And I, I think that it's important that I say, you know, the nature of leadership has changed for me, but the importance of leadership is ongoing. And um, 
it's more than just leadership of others, but it's taking uh, control of what you do with this, uh, this way of engaging the world. Our responsibility is so much broader than it ever was before. And it's grown to include things that aren't three-dimensional. You know, they're economic, they're cultural. And I hope we have some good conversation about this because, and this wasn't meant to be a lecture, just a moment in time of sharing where I am um, in my ongoing career uh, as a designer. So I thank you very much. Allison, thank you. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, before I, I bring in some of the folks in the chat, I have a question for you. How long did it take you to get comfortable and get your head around designing these very long building typologies? To tell you the truth, I didn't know I was doing it. I didn't, I really didn't realize that it was kind of, it had become a go-to starting point whenever um, the issue of how to site a building, um, it, when the site permitted it, you know, first and foremost, understanding where the sun is um, became the most important thing. And then in many ways, then drawing the line of kind of maximum dimension as a, as a kind of an, a point of engagement for uh, glazing, you know, for enclosed space that would have glazing that wants to be uh, as permissive of daylight into usable occupied space as possible. And the more of that that you could create, the more uses that you could kind of um, mash against that alignment, um, became a little bit of a game, frankly, you know, and, and, and the discussion about what needs daylight and what doesn't need daylight also with clients, um, it became a big conversation. Um, I think with labs, we know that we have to environmentally uh, control all aspects of the interior um, space, but more and more, and anyone who's doing labs now knows how there's been a shift over getting the office space that used to be quite often embedded in the lab module, you know, finding a way to pull that outside of the lab module so that um, the scientists are not uh, burdened with needing to stay in the absolute super controlled environment and be able to move out, you know, with certain restrictions on what can come in and out of the labs, but with the ability to actually engage daylight when they're not in the act of using the research. Uh, facility. So this elongation, this kind of axial notion, um, I think over time, and I, I don't think I really even realized it uh, until, well, I, I guess I realized it, but even on this Texas, new Texas project, it became very clear, you know, this was going to be a long, beautiful shade structure, and it was going to really try and minimize the amount of interior conditioned space, and the client has really bought into it. It has a huge stage associated with it. So part of the, the big roof idea is about how to engage the, the um, coverage for the stage within the expression of a shade structure in this park. And the topography, working with Mia, you know, we're working the topography and trying to nestle the thing down and orient it just right so that at certain moments of the day, those southeast breezes just scream through there and, and make it a pleasant place to be. Well, thanks. That, I, I, I think you're you're very fortunate that you're able to let these let these projects grow, and you have the room to let them grow, which uh, probably allows them to get longer. Um, I'm yep. going to um, ask Kate. Uh, Steve Kordowski in Cleveland has a question, and then we'll go to uh, Mike Mock in uh, Dayton, or I'm sorry, Cincinnati. Do you, do, you I can stop, hear. do you want me to stop sharing my screen, Robert? What, 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 sure, whatever's best. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hey, I, I really enjoyed seeing your project concept sketches. And since uh, you and I are 
very close in age. Um, the question is, how do we get the young architects away from computers and back to sketching? Yeah. Um, and, and just just for, I, I gotta make this clarification. You know, I'm not against technology, but I firmly believe architects need to draw. Well, I agree with you. And I, you know, I, I don't think even the younger generation disagrees with you. Um, I believe that, that um, there are some things that you can imagine very quickly, obviously with technology that you couldn't imagine um, without it. I mean, it, it sponsors your ability to think about things in a more um, precise fashion, a more kind of intertwined fashion, you know, that allows you to resolve, you know, multiple directions of thought more quickly. Um, but that said, I think conceptually, though, we're still able um, through that hand-eye connection to identify um, the components of the big idea. And I, I, at some point, realized, although I never learned AutoCAD, I kind of skipped AutoCAD. I was right on the cusp um, of, of the generation that needed it. Um, and I decided that I would not use my brain cells to teach myself AutoCAD, but I would become like the SketchUp queen from hell. <laughs> and I think that that gave me the tool, the communicating tool that I needed with, um, with my teams, not only to be able to throw things back and forth digitally, but also um, for me to uh, do a sketch, hand sketch, and then take it into SketchUp myself and give it some parameters, really loose, like don't try and measure things, but conceptually make it a three-dimensional thing that you can spin around, that it is not a two-dimensional exercise for your team to take that two-dimensional drawing. There's so much interpretation that happens between plan and section that somehow being able to um, submit two-dimensional information in SketchUp as, as an idea generator and then share the SketchUp model with the team. And oddly enough, um, if you require them to reciprocate in the opposite direction, or require them to sketch, require them to lay over, you know, require them to draw it in two dimensions or to draw an axonometric, you know, it's a little bit of the mentorship, I think, that we are responsible for to, to bring them back. And just like with our own um, group, you know, some people are more comfortable with drawing. Um, I'd much rather draw than talk. And it looks rude sometimes, but you know, sometimes that's where you're gonna figure out what you're doing is by drawing. And so to, to bring that um, back around for the next generation, I think it's important. So I'm not disagreeing with you, I agree. Thanks. Mike, you had a couple questions. Yeah, I did have a couple. Um, so I, I noticed one, uh, like one of those buildings uh, was a you know fe uh, government building, the NASA building maybe. Um, were, the, were those buildings or your projects, are they uh, lead rated buildings? They were all lead um, desired. Um, I believe the one at Ames has turned out gold. Um, the one at Langley is, they were never completely told on seeking the lead um, actual definition, but they did use the, the guidelines. And so I doubt that the one at Langley uh, uh, reached a certification. Uh, the one up on the hill at Lawrence Livermore, I'm, I'm sorry, at Lawrence Berkeley, um, I believe is silver, silver, maybe gold, but you know, ACOM, I should say, um, in my time there, including the new Kings arena up in Sacramento, you know, it is the first gold, um, certified, um, basketball arena, uh, in the country. And I led the competition with, uh, of the others at ACOM in the other disciplines, landscape, hugely engineers, you know, our environmental um, team 
uh, while I was at AECOM, we won that competition. The design as it came out is, is nothing really like what the competition imagined it to be, but in principle, it is principled in the idea of conducting the breezes off of the Delta. And, you know, so I believe that, you know, we're still educating our clients somehow, but with this big leap toward 2030, you know, it's really no longer uh, a discussion led by lead, but more just climate change, resilience, and, um, and if you do those things, right, including using existing um, stock of buildings and building as little as possible, our ability to reach what would be lead certification um, is, is a very low threshold. So I liked your um, I liked your photos of your black and white photos, and you you made a point of saying that you liked them better that way. Did did you model them in black and white when you were designing them, or did, was that sort of a happy accident that they ended up photographing well in black and white? Uh, and, and and or is that was that sort of an intention that you had? Well, I I think I enjoy modeling. The, those SketchUp models that were part of that um, particular NASA uh, project in uh, Langley, um, I built that SketchUp model. Mind you, we were, I was just like, oh, the design team was in Washington, D.C. So I was designing on the West Coast and working with a kind of skeletal team in, um, in D.C. And so the model you know, for me was really about understanding where the sun is. It was less about the materiality of the building proper. There is a campus vocabulary of materials. And um, I knew that portions of it were going to be, uh, going to need to be tethered to that uh, master plan uh, material palette. Um, I personally wish the building wasn't quite so dark and that it would have been a lighter building in terms of the tile, color of the tile, but that tile turned out to be very, very, it is part of very much part of the vocabulary of the historic campus. So being able to preserve the body um, as the, the um, commitment to the, that material palette and take the brisa lay and treat it like a layer, take the capsule and treat it like an adicula and you know make it do what it needs to do and make it lighter and less absorptive was the ab light absorptive and that was the idea to really bring it out something really white but the SketchUp model was all white no question my last question maybe is more interesting uh, at least to me is is when when was the first time you realized that you as an african-american architect ha had a a voice to be listened to um, by young uh, African American architects or students. Well, I'm going to turn that question back on you because I think I've always felt that I was a voice to be listened to by any upcoming young architect who, you know, having cut my teeth at Skidmore for 17 or 18 years, it never occurred to me that um, that, that wasn't a way to to uh, kind of spend my brain. You know, it never occurred to me that that doing that was something that uh, that was going to be identified as unusual or spectacular because of my race and my gender. You know, I to the day that I left remained one, if not the only, um, senior associate partner in design at Skidmore, um, and uh, I always would look, still do look for young talent and it, it comes in many shapes and forms and colors and genders and you know i i want very much for our profession to diversify um, through the process of people who are really passionate about design finding a place to engage it at the level that they can be most productive so i i know and i'm glad that there may be some younger people who see me and they will suddenly realize that, you know, I could do that. 
I could be that. You know, to me, that's what real diversity, where it all begins. But for me, I did not think about it when I was doing, you have to know that. I did not think about it when I was doing that. I was doing what I really, I think, was supposed to be doing. And only in those few moments where you realize, you know, I'm the only person of color in this room, or I'm the only black, I'm the only woman in this room. You know, you just cannot think about that, or you just, you're really limiting your own ability to do your best. Thank you. Allison, I think we have time for one more question, and uh, Jack Bialaski has one. Hi, Allison. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciated your talk tonight and your work, and particularly how thoughtful you have been about thinking about um, this phase of your career and how to be um, most productive and uh, contribute the most. Uh, really, really applaud you for that. Um, my, my question for you is um, about the Pittsburgh Museum, uh, African American Museum, and in thinking about and looking at the lab buildings and the other buildings that you have shown, which are parts of institutions and which have programs that are um, have many constraints and requirements and institutional requirements relative to what the architecture might have to be or be permitted to be. I'm wondering what about that um, project, the Pittsburgh Museum, um, that you were thinking about that makes it specifically of that place and about um, African American culture uh, as opposed to any other type of cultural museum that uh, you know might be somewhere else. Yeah, I mean that that is the um, the question of the of the moment, and um, I was quite frankly shocked to win the competition because my competitors, who are all friends, um, perhaps had a more um, definitive language um, about the building and its reference to African American heritage. My attitude was that Pittsburgh is a city of concrete and steel and brick and, you know, and those industries were in glass. Those industries were built on the backbone of lots of immigrants. And uh, so the building itself in its kind of clarity, its straightforward use of materials and um, its kind of elemental um, respect for the street and the urban grid um, were pri its primary allegiance. Um, but it also had a responsibility to be uh, not fixed in time. That every time you walk by this building, it'll be different depending on what's going on inside. And so it's really more about the contents than it is about the enclosure when it all comes down to it. It's the content of the character. And I think that uh, Martin Luther King had a quote that was better stated than I just stated it, but it's really about what's going on inside there. You know, come in, be part of it. You know, share what's going on in your culture by bringing it into this building. And when I say it's a nighttime building, it, 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 it comes alive at night. You know, it has basic ideas about um, a strong wall of brick that is um, carried in from African, East African villages. The idea of walls that surround um, towns that are very textured stone. That's an idea about place. Um, the notion about the corner being a form that, you know, I didn't call it a sale exactly, but it is definitely inspired by the house sales that carried culture from the African continent, nailing it on the corner and giving the building almost this, it has motion somehow. It's a statement that the culture has motion, that the building is always changing and yet it anchors 
a place in Pittsburgh. And so for me, the, the abstractions are there. They're not hitting you in the face or over the head, but they're there. And I think once you, um, once you uh, find what they mean to you, then you can, I believe in this ability for people to grab onto what they see and use it how they want to use it. I really believe in that in cultural buildings, especially. And, and this really isn't a museum. It's really so much more than that. You know, right after it was finished, the um, G20 was held here and the, the technology and the um, communication backbone of the place is so strong and at the moment absolutely state of the art that they held all of their um, simulcasts, simulcasts globally from the main um, multi-use space. And so this is, this is a building that invites and educates. Allison, I loved your answer. And uh, I agree with you entirely that those abstract ideas are really like a scaffold that has to be taken down, uh, you know, when the building is completed and that people will interpret it however they will and there's truth in whatever they perceive. And so I really did love your answer and particularly about how welcoming that building is to pull people into it to experience the culture that's actually taking place there. Well, Allison, I appreciate your time and I really enjoyed hearing from you and your work as I'm sure our, our participants and members have as well. Uh, again, um, in the chat box, um, there is a form for learning units and we hope to see you in a month's time for Axiome, which is a firm out of St. Louis for our final lecture of the season. Um, I. I hope you have a great end of the week and look forward to talking to you soon, Allison. Thank you so much, Robert, and to all of you at the AA Ohio. Thanks. Go Bucks. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> yeah, go Bucks. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.